Look, there was nothing gentle about show. Because those dogs that found themselves in court, that was the exception, not the rule. And, and, and Dagoretti is proof. What happened in Dagoretti? Oh, these, these, these gangsters just showed up one day, holding on to big guns and started... You know who tell, who tell this story better? Who? This guy. This guy? Yes. He was on one of the officers at the scene, and I haven't met anyone who knows Sho's background better than you. After you, is that right? Pidi Sho. <laughs> that guy. You know, he was once defended in parliament, right? Hang on, for real? Um, yeah, I thought someone like you would have this information. You don't know? <laughs> None of you know? Damn. Well, it is 1981. The then assistant minister in the office of the president, Mr. John King, has been summoned by parliament to give an update on the government's effort in curbing crime in the country. Now the minister puts his documents in order, adjusts his tie, and rises to give a nonchalant response as if he had always been expecting that query. 981 gangsters were arrested in the past year, he declares. A number that seems too impressive to dissolve any follow-up questions that may have been lined up, especially at a time when questions were not the most favorable use of vocabulary in the then political scene. But then, one MP with enough courage to pump up the cowardly dog rises up to dish a question at John King that he hoped would throw the minister off balance. And why is it that Patrick Shaw is always the first to arrive in the scene of a crime in North African police? Now, for all the suspicion and insinuation behind that question, it was a good question. Who was this guy? I mean, he, he was never in official uniform, never had an official badge, and was driving a civilian car, a cream white Volvo fitted with a blue light at the top. Now, to understand the wonder of just who exactly Patrick David Shaw was, we have to go back in time and trace out the genesis of the legend that would later be referred to as Romeo 9 within the police force. A boy is born in London in 1936, and growing up, he realizes he does not fit in with his age mates. He's, uh, well, uh, uh, larger than the rest of them. <laughs> so he gets teased every time he tries to interact with them. And the boy's father, a prominent doctor who later succumbed to tuberculosis, leaves him only with his mother, whom he loved dearly. Even later on, when his life got too dramatic, Patrick Shaw would still write to his mother on a weekly basis. Now from then on, the writing was on the wall. Patrick would dedicate his life to fighting crime and the forces of evil! song to the workings of the dude in question. Patrick David Shaw worked as an agricultural officer around Rift Valley where he was known for being kind but mischievous. Now he loved being the boss, even took up leadership roles where he would uh, organize field trips to agricultural shows for the club's members and occasionally would allow them to drive his tractor. What a guy, right? Well, he had a lust for justice that did not allow him to rest on the idea of allowing him to be a farmer for the rest of his life. Shaw wanted to do more, and so in 1959, he joins Kenya police as a reservist. Yes, I know you need that term defined. A reservist is basically a person appointed by the police. Think of it as a civilian consultant who is allowed to carry a gun and hold other jobs. Patrick Shaw! was a man on the run from the aristocracy in England where he could not fit in. In Kenya, he was a double outcast. He did not fit in with the whites or the Africans. Now he gets enticed by the loud calling from a growing metropolis. And so in the same year, he packed his bags, wiped soil off his shoes, and off to Nairobi he goes to be a driver for St. John Ambulance. And it is still a wonder how he managed to get to emergency calls on time considering his, well, a... Uh, heavy-duty self, <laughs> you know? 
Unfortunately, Patrick forgets to leave behind his mischievous ways in Rift Valley. He gets fired from St. John when he crashes an ambulance that he was not meant to be driving. Now things were moving too fast, too soon for Patrick Shaw. So to take a break from things, he goes back to London in 1962 to rekindle friendships and visit family members. While there, he reads an intriguing headline in the newspapers about the Sunshine Kids. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's show. My name is Host. Now in the headlines tonight, <laughs> Starihi Boys Center is on a tour in London to promote their Youth Helps Youth campaign. And a good fellow by the name of Patrick Shaw wishes to assist in its activities. At the head of it is the center's founder and director, Mr. Geoffrey Griffin. Now for more news and headlines, join us at 9 o'clock. Now Shaw shows up, see what I did there, at his doorstep and offers to help. This would start a friendship between Shaw and Griffin that would last more than three decades. Shaw and Griffin return to Nairobi in 1965. Shaw resigns entirely from agricultural duties. He becomes a naturalized citizen by 1971, but before that, he accepts an offer from Griffin to become Starehe Boy's administrative officer at a modest pay. It seems he could make the suffix officer to any job title and entice Shaw with it. The man just wanted to be Batman, for God's sake. Now much of his salary would be spent on exciting escapades for students at Starehe. Patrick Shaw would pick five of his students in his Volvo, then drive off to Nairobi National Park. But before reaching the entrance, a few of the students would get out of the passenger seat and hide in the trunk, so Shaw would not have to pay for their entrance fees. Now, he then would drive far away from the guards, and only when the coast was clear would he allow them to get out of the trunk. As if not enough. Patrick Shaw would pull over a few meters from the exit and have the same number of boys get into the trunk. Only difference this time was that it was a different group of boys than the first who would get into the trunk on their way out. Oh, Equality strikes again! But wait! If there were five boys and suppose three of them took turns to enter the trunk, it means that among the five there was always that one kid who would enter the trunk twice. Two plus two is four. Minus one plus three. Quick math, boom! We are done now. Now, some students were known and referred to as Shaw's boys. You know, the kids who take on overseas tours, fundraisers, help give career advice, rehabilitate, protect, and use them as spies in the criminal underworld. You get it, right? Fatherly stuff, am I right? Boys will be boys, am I right? Men before shame, you get me? Ah, he gets me. Patrick would take a few students to East Lee and Kibera, posting them as spies in different bars and restaurants. The boys would then report back to Patrick Shaw, and if they positively identified a suspect, Patrick Shaw would summon police reserves and surround the area. Most times, it would end with the occasional shootout. You know those ones, right? The thangs fire under us. My boy is fire in the back. <laughs> the survivors were taken to mortuary and then led to hospital for treatment. You know the story, right? Well, very seldom would there be any survivors or ever show appeared. His white Volvo, which he always traveled and became an embodiment of his persona. <clears throat> the car was modified especially for him with a custom seat that he could lie back in. It was fitted with a CB radio. A CB radio is in full definition a citizen's band radio, used in short distance communications. It's like a walkie talkie, minus the walkie part. <laughs> it was also fitted with a blue rooftop light for when he was policing the dangerous, dark, mysterious, mischievous, stale, pale, decaying, grain, concrete streets of Nairobi. Going into the worst parts in the city and creating an impression of omnipresence. Parts where regular cops will not even think about visiting. Now the car was famous and most people knew the number plate of head. K F H 845. He would spend a lot of time in his car. Especially during evenings where he would read FBI manuals, memorizing photos of wanted criminals and occasionally sleeping. Now, Shaw had basically memorized the entire Kenyan penal code, but Shaw barely got some sleep. You see, he had a condition. 
a glandular disorder which hinders normal functioning like sleeping and was responsible for his obesity. That's what Mr. Bruce Patrick Batman Shaw Wayne was suffering from. <laughs> well, maybe not suffering. You see, Shaw saw sleeping as a witness and time wasting. And it worked for him with his trigger happy self. Most times, Nairobi would clear out the sidewalks just by seeing Shaw stepping on it. Nairobi thought he had supernatural powers. Despite weighing close to 139 kilograms, he was incredibly fast on his feet. He was described as brisk lightning. Them. Can you imagine all that weight on top of you? I doubt he had to run much though. For you see, legend has it that criminals and their guns simply dropped out of their hands when they came face to face with Big Pat Shaw. So basically, he was also Magneto from X-Men. <laughs> now Patrick was a magnificent shot. A sharp shooter with no remorse. At a shootout with thugs, he would wait for six rounds to go off and then go for the kill. <laughs> then all of a sudden, Nairobi was a crime-fearing town with criminals hiding at the sight of his Volvo. An aura of fear built itself around him and he used it to full advantage. It is said that criminals simply handed themselves in once they heard Patrick Shaw was on their case. But, but, but. Patrick would use some of his students in his rescue missions. One evening in 1977, Patrick Shaw, with the help of three students and the police officer, rescued a man stranded on a tree during a flood. Three weeks later, uh, near Nairobi West Shopping Center, Patrick Shaw, with a group of students, rescued two Asian youths trapped on top of a car that had been washed about 180 meters down the road. A boy was enlisted to swim out to the vehicle with the rope. Now, as I mentioned before, Street kids were used in his network, in his spy network, and many of them were brought into the center to be reformed. He would encourage suitable students to enlist in the police, especially those who did not qualify for college. <laughs> they would be integrated into Nairobi Flying Squad and nicknamed Mr. Shaw's Flying School, a very misleading title to Harris. Now, some people claimed that he was a hired gun, but he sure did have a certain value as a white man who was willing to follow any orders. He was a role model to the Starehe boys, even had them get funding from arguably the world's best footballer of all time, Abedi Pele. Salute. <laughs> whoa, 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 what the fuck? <laughs> Can I face a fucking decorated story already? I first saw Shaw in a in action in a robbery that happened in Dagorete in 1986. A gang of five had robbed a shop and had taken off in a getaway car. Now Shaw, being the criminal mind reader that he was, parked his trademark Volvo along a road that was the only known way out and laid there in wait. The folks around them knew that there was going to be bloodshed just from seeing Shaw's car. As the suspects were being flushed out of hiding, the flying squad radioed Shaw that the gang in their getaway car were en route towards him. Soon enough, the car burst through a corner, tires screeching at high notes and speeding towards him. Patrick Shaw jumped into the middle of the road with a pistol in each hand and kablam, 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 began unloading on the speeding car, managing to hit the driver and bringing the car to an abrupt halt. When the rest of the thugs jumped out trying to escape, Patrick Shaw gunned them down in quick succession. Minutes later, as his gun's barrels were cooling down and after shaking off the gunpowder that had smeared his palicue, Patrick Shaw walked over to the dead suspects, flipped their bodies over and identified each one by name. He then turned to the crowd that had gathered around the borders of the crime scene and as was accustomed to him, warned them to stay off crime or else. As if not enough, the flying squad had managed to capture alive one of the robbers and dragged him into the crime scene. The poor guy was still clutching onto the loot bag when he came face to face with Big Pat Shaw. Now this was it. His friends lay dead on the ground and he would be the only one left to tell the grand story to his kids many years from now. Patrick Shaw was standing there watching him. It was a second chance for him, a new beginning. Let go of the bag, he tells himself. Let go. 
Reform begins with you letting go and accepting your situation. <laughs> Fate has been kind to him. Unlike his dead colleagues, he was going to jail. <laughs> Kaplum! Nonsense. No such thing as jail to Patrick Shaw. You live by the bullet, you die by it. After going through the loot bag, Patrick Shaw instructed the Ascaris to step aside, raised his pistol to the captured thug, and gave him a proper big Pat Shaw send off. <laughs> Much, much, much later. I've always wondered how Shaw was able to operate with so much freedom. He wasn't even a police officer. He was a reservist. He, he wasn't attached to any police station. He used his personal car in operations. <laughs> you know he'd risen to the level of senior superintendent, huh? Yes, uh, yes, yes. But did that make him unquestionable? I mean, come on, we have seen a number of senior superintendents between us in our career. How many of them have been defended in Parliament? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah there's that. That, coupled with the fact that he was present when J.M. Kariki was killed, mm. makes me very suspicious of him. Mm. Ah, yes, 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 yes. J.M. was bound to pop up. You know, I've always followed the J.M. story closely. And I, I, I had interacted with the man a few times before, and I remember the number of bombs that shook Nairobi in early 90s. Starting with the lavatory of Star Lit Nightclub. Mm. See, these hoaxes had been coming into the police uh, and to the media, warning of bombs planted in random places in the city. They came to nothing, though, up until Star Lit was hit. Mm. It brought a cloud of fear over the city. People were dense, living in terror. And the hoaxes continued right after that bomb. So many that at some point the police decided that. They're not going to take them seriously. Up until another bomb exploded outside him. Now there were speculations. People were wondering who, who the perpetrators were and what they wanted. Leaflets hopped up. And these leaflets claimed that the bombings were being done by a shadowy organization called the Maskini Liberation Organization. Its leaders, the leaflets claimed, included J.M. Karyuki and, J, uh, uh, and Charles Rufia. Well, it turns out, this was all part of a propaganda campaign against J.M. Kaluki. You see, he had angered the government, had fallen out of the ruling elite because of his defense of the poor people and the bombastic speeches he gave defending the poor when he hit him. There was a plot to eliminate him. And J.M. knew it. Now, in a bit, to get away from the toxic Nairobi atmosphere because the, the being blamed for the bombing was taking a toll on him. He decided to take a trip to Mombasa and, you know, chill out on the beach for a few days. A friend went all the way to OTC to book two bus tickets. Incidentally, another friend convinced JM not to take the bus to Mombasa, which was very, very lucky for him because that bus was blown up killing 27 people and injuring many others. <laughs> or maybe he wasn't that lucky. Because the next day, he was accosted by a number of police officers, senior police officers, outside the hill. Yes, including you, Patrick Shaw. You see, Shaw had taken it upon himself to follow uh, J.M.'s car for a few days. And on that day, he also took it upon himself to chase away all the taxi drivers and the parking boys who used to hang outside the hill. For good reason. A very good reason. See, he didn't want any eyewitnesses. Why? Because that was the last time that J.M. Karyuki was seen alive in public. Now, his involvement became a, a stain that Shaw couldn't wash off. It messed with his reputation that he had built as an incorruptible crime fighter. And in this business, either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Do you think his death was natural? I mean, he lived by the gun, right? It makes sense for him to die by it. Of course, he had to be the conspiracy nut. 
Kijana jichunge. Eka. Wee! Hehehe. Ah, Missy. Do you want to I have no idea how such a small person like you can have that many girls. <laughs> I don't even know why you've given me this one. You probably have 50 more than I've got. Now, as I was saying, it doesn't add up. Hey, hey, hey. This is my story. Please let me tell it. Thank you very much. It is on Valentine's Day, 1988, while visiting a friend. It was on Valentine's Day, 1988, while visiting a friend, David Rock, a former assistant police commissioner, that show suddenly collapsed in a heap on the floor. Now, David was momentarily shocked. Had someone finally dared to attack them, he rushed to the side of his friend and checked his past, then rushed him to Nairobi Hospital. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the age of 52. In the next few days, all the newspapers eulogized Patrick Shaw as a gunslinger par excellence, a crime buster, a legend. His funeral service on the 20th of February 1988 at Sarehe Boys Center was packed to total capacity. Hundreds, hundreds sat and stood outside in the courtyard. Everyone had come to witness the send-off. The people he had worked tirelessly to protect. The boys who grew up under his watch at Sarehe. Police officers, informants, pimps, prostitutes, carjackers, robbers, everyone was there. It was the de definition of Usingoje Kwambiwa Goda. <laughs> everyone wanted to be sure Shaw was dead before they went back home in fear or in celebration. Now, after the message, after the service was done, the boys who considered him their adoptive father carried the coffin to the hearse. Uh, the cortege, I've always wanted to use that word. The cortege, or burial procession, as most of you and learned folk call it, <laughs> was three kilometers long. His body was taken around the city he had watched over, and people lined up the streets to pay their last respects to the murderous saint that they had heard so much about. Now, at Langata, Chief Justice Cecil Miller read a message of condolence from President Moy himself. It praised Shaw for his untiring, selfless, sacrificial service to law and order for the benefit of his fellow men. After the message was read, he was laid to rest. And that is when the speculations grew wings. <gasps> Did he actually die of a heart attack? Was he poisoned? <laughs> what if he was shot and everyone was hiding it? Why did Griffin insist on having a closed casket funeral? What was he hiding? Was Shaw so disfigured that they did not want anyone to see him? Yeah. <gasps> <laughs> and Hamisi, I would also love answers to those questions. Personally, I don't give a damn if he died of a heart attack or spontaneous combustion. As long as that thing is gone. <laughs> I don't get why we don't just burn this thing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There are names in these files that will turn this country upside down if yeah. this thing lives in public. <laughs> Wait a minute. So now that we have this file, does it mean we own Kenya? <laughs> this deserves a drink. <laughs> No. 
Never. Yeah, 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 yeah